The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has several ways it can help private landowners who may be interested in restoring wildlife habitat. Last year, we discovered one project underway, practically in our backyard. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has the Partners for Fish and Wildlife Private Lands Program, where we work with private landowners to restore wildlife habitat on their property. And for the most part, these are under uh, you know, 10 or 15 year contracts. And then some landowners are interested in, in also in permanent protection. So then we work through our, our program with uh, taking perpetual easements to help them protect that property in perpetuity. And the Partners Program has private lands biologists that will come out and work with the landowner and provide technical assistance and we do offer some financial assistance as well to restore wildlife habitat. Now they might be interested in, in the aesthetic value of that wildlife habitat, wetlands or prairie, and then also for recreational use as well, hunting or potentially fishing, photography, those types of things. Identify what their goals are for their property and then work with them to restore that uh, area that, that may be beneficial to them. In the 1970s, some of the staff with uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and with Minnesota DNR recognized that in order to have sustainable uh, wildlife populations, we needed to work beyond our public lands. That started uh, the work with uh, private landowners surrounding public lands to restore wildlife habitat. And that way, uh, wildlife could expand beyond those boundaries of the public lands. And, and that program really started here in, in the Fergus Falls area. In the, in the late 1970s and, and then early 1980s. And then the Partners Program was officially established in 1987 and now is available nationwide in all 50 states and as active programs available. The Olson family has used available wildlife restoration programs for many years. In 1883, my great-grandfather, Frederick Olson, immigrated here from Sweden and he bought the uh, one quarter for $600 back then. So uh, my sister and Diane and I are lucky that we had that history. So we grew up on a pretty well, I call it a hunting farm. But back then, of course, they farmed it and they did a lot of tiling. And after that, my great grandfather inherited or bought the farm. His name was uh, Gustav Olson. And then my father bought the farm later. And my dad's name is Wallace Olson. So then my sister and I we, and our spouses, we bought the farm probably 30 some years ago on a contract for deed and my folks passed away and then I guess you can say we inherited it. And then when uh, I grew up, I was probably 10 years old, my dad taught me how to hunt and it's really a duck hunting place with the lakes we had then. Not many wetlands because they drained them all by then. When my dad finished farming and retired, well then uh, the CRP program was something we could take advantage of. So it's been in CRP pretty much for the last 30 years. And then the U.S. Fish and Wildlife came up with some good ideas how we could uh, dam up the wetland that was already existing, leave the tile in place and just put risers in. So we did that on about five different locations. Now this last time when we re-enrolled uh, for this last term for CRP, Sean Papan from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife had a program that uh, was quite more intensive where we broke the tile and created some wetlands that probably had been there 130 years ago. In the spring of 2013, we got this project referred to us from U.S. Department of Ag. We found out that John was thinking about restoring some wetlands out here on his last CRP enrollment. And I got to talking with John and we uh, surveyed seven different drained wetlands on this property. And we ended up re restoring five of them. And by re restoring them, we mean that we brought back the natural hydrology and the topography of the wetlands. By doing that, we restored all of the wetlands by filling in ditches and breaking drain tile. And on this property, the uh, drain tile was old concrete tiles. They're about a foot long, and the farmers laid them end to end. And the drain tile was put below grade, and the tile would drain the excess water off of the field to make it to where you, you could farm it. So on all of these wetlands here, we removed a section of that drain tile and which was about 100 feet of tile that we took out with an excavator and we put a tile riser in. And the tile riser is we basically put an elbow on a piece of non-perforated pipe and raise that up to the elevation that we want the wetland to be restored to. So we bring back the natural full pool of, of the wetland. So most of these wetlands are between two to four feet deep now and before they were completely dry. 
One of the wetlands that we restored on John's property was impacted by sediment. And the sediment over the course of about 100 years of farming had washed into the wetland. And in, in, in this case, this wetland had about 18 inches of sediment that had washed from the upland down into the wetland and had basically covered up the original wetland topsoil. And you could actually see the, the snail shells and the black topsoil below the light tan topsoil of the upland. As part of the restoration process, we removed this sediment with a D6H bulldozer, pushed all that dirt that should have been on the uplands back up to the tops of the hills surrounding the wetland and exposed the, the original wetland soil. This uh, brought the original depth of the wetland back again and exposed the uh, seed bank that has been buried for decades. Our hope is that this will Im improve the quality of the wetland restoration in the uh, long term. And we've noticed that even so, even in the CRP and the other wetland work, we keep a fairly good log of our hunting for the last 30 some years. And uh, blue winged teal is top of the list, and that's because of all the prairie grass that we have when they're nesting out in that natural habitat. And of course, other things like deer and so on, it's been very beneficial. We work with the uh, youth groups and some local sportsmen's clubs. You know, they make these cylinder nests that you probably see out here in the background. So we have about 80 of those on this farm and the neighboring farm in the water and then about uh, 50 wood duck houses. And that's one thing that we can raise here, and that's wood ducks because of all the oak trees. It really is a farm that is suitable to what U.S. Fish and Wildlife has helped us with. So now it's a great waterfowl habitat for breeding. John's farm is in the heart of the prey pothole region in western Minnesota. So this is a great breeding area for blue winged teal mallards and uh, wood ducks. But even more than the, the uh, breeding purposes of these wetlands is the migration habitat. During the spring and the fall, ducks will come through on migration either going north or going south. So they're great habitat for uh, waterfowl for both migration and breeding. But not just waterfowl, I mean, wetlands are super Im Im important for all sorts of non-game birds, such as uh, bitterns and rails snipe, all these sorts of things. So in addition, they provide all sorts of other benefits to the public, such as recharging groundwater, controlling floods, controlling e erosion. They filter the water, and the water that comes out of wetlands is way better water quality than the water that, that, that goes in. In total, there was five wetlands that were restored out, out here, in addition to five or more that John's done in years past, in addition to what wetlands he has existing out, out here. So there's 15 or more potholes on his farm in the mix of a variety of uh, native grasses, so it's a perfect uh, waterfowl breeding area now. The Minnesota DNR has been collecting time-lapse images to document wetland restoration on the Olson farm. I work for uh, the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources for the section of wildlife, and my title is a private lands wildlife coordinator. So what that means is that I work a lot with other agencies and organizations that have private land responsibilities. Some of my job responsibilities include uh, outreach and education to the public. This particular project that we're doing um, is a statewide project. We're using time-lapse photography to document and promote the work that resource managers are doing to restore wetlands and manage shallow lakes. And currently I believe we're up to eight or nine cameras statewide. Uh, we have the cameras set up at a wide array of different um, wetland and shallow lake sites uh, in different areas of the state just to show the diverse array of projects that we're working on. Um, the whole purpose of this, in addition to documenting the work that resource managers are doing. We are hoping to use this information to visually show the public the importance of doing this resource management work uh, for the benefit of wildlife and water quality. Once these videos are created, we're going to post them to the DNR website. At this particular site, we have a camera set up and we're documenting a wetland restoration that was done by the Fish and Wildlife Service. We have had the camera set up for one year already and the camera is set up to take a photo every hour of daylight. We're capturing uh, changes that occur slowly over a long period of time and they'll be compressed into a short video presentation. The Partners for Wildlife program is available nationally. So to learn more about this and other services available where you live, check out the Fish and Wildlife Service website at fws.com. Yeah.